This is the Louis T. Network. In the lab room. Welcome to this In the Lab Room exclusive. I'm your host, Lou. Thank you for joining me. Here to break down what I have entitled Jonathan Martin, A Dolphin Nightmare. Now, as you all know, and I've stated this several times and reiterated it, I'm a football guy. Don't really like dealing with issues that are non-football related, but as a football guy, I would be remiss if I did not cover this subject matter as this is a multi-layered topic and I almost find myself fascinated by some of the issues that have arisen from this situation and like I said, me being a psych major and all of those things when I was in college at one point, this fascinates me. The human psyche and, and how it works and, and how things transpire, it makes me think. It makes me wonder. And so I find myself here talking to you about this Jonathan Martin situation. And again, if I had it my way, I wouldn't be talking about this. Honestly, it has nothing to do with football, but I feel like this is a subject matter that needs to be discussed because this is something that I won't say it's prevalent in the National Football League and I'll talk about that here in this breakdown but it's something that if you're going to play sports that you at some point might have to deal with and so let's talk about this so I'll use the assistance of my big board. Let's go ahead and turn around and get to Jonathan Martin, a dolphin nightmare. And I've got a couple of stars here that I want to discuss in this program. Let's start with how slash why did this happen? Jonathan Martin, second round pick, 2012 draft. Miami Dolphins out of Stanford drafted him to potentially be the left tackle of the future. I think he was more suited for the right side and Jake Long went down with the injury. He had to be moved over to the left side. He struggled and the Dolphins and I, and I honestly believe they did this. If you watched Hard Knocks remember the Cincinnati Bengals were on Hard Knocks this offseason. But the previous offseason, it was the Miami Dolphins. And if you watch that group on Hard Knocks, you can honestly see something like this occurring in their locker room. I, I know I can. I don't know about you. Watching that Hard Knocks, I saw some guys with a lot of bravado, especially GM Jeff Ira. He's a guy that definitely strikes me as an old school guy. He grew up around football. Dad was a coach. You know, dad was around football. He was around football. He was around those 85 Bears that, that Ditka coached Bears football team. He was around that atmosphere. And so he grew up in an era where, hey, you better toughen up. And tough guys won. So I could see a guy like Jeff Ireland and, and this has been reported. We don't know all the facts. And again, I'm not going to sit here and act as if I know all the facts because I don't. But there are reports out that Jeff Ireland and the, the internal brass of the Dolphins said to Richie Incognito, hey, we'd like you to toughen up. And as we know, I've said this before. I'll say it again. And I'll continue to say it until my face turns blue. Richie Incognito is crazy. And not crazy in, in terms of wanting to generate a 15-yard penalty. He's not Cortland Finnegan crazy. He's Harvey Dahl. He's Kyle Turley. He's Steve Smith crazy. Okay, there's levels of craziness in the National Football League. In every sport, there are guys that you just don't mess with. In every sport, that if you mess with them, there are consequences for your actions because these guys... This isn't a joke to them. It isn't just a game. 
And if you want to take it there, they will, they will take it there with you. I'll give you an example. Steve Smith got into it with Janoris Jenkins. Double J probably crossed the line somewhere in his trash-talking exploits during the Carolina Panthers-St. Louis Rams game about three weeks ago. He probably said something about Steve Smith's wife or something along those lines, and he drew the line. Steve Smith said, hey, you cross the line. You want to trash talk? Fine. I can take it there. After the game, they asked Steve about it, and Steve said, if I see him on the street, I want to punch him in his effing face. That's crazy. Not Portland Finnegan crazy. I want to get in your head and force you to get a 15-yard penalty. Not Dennis Rodman crazy. I want to get inside your head and force you to get a technical foul. This is, I see you on the street. I want to beat your A crazy. That's a totally different crazy. Not everybody's that crazy. Harvey Dahl, Kyle Turley, another one of those guys that's crazy. Throw Richie Incognito in that group of those offensive linemen that are crazy. So they went to Richie. They said, hey, you're one of the toughest guys on this team. You're the leader of this offensive line group. Toughen him up. He's a little soft, a little you know, rough around the edges. We need this guy to be sturdy. If he can't be the second round draft pick that we drafted him to be, if he can't be a guy that can stand up at the point of attack for us, we're going to be in some trouble. We need you to bail us out, Richie. Now, they didn't tell Richie Incognito to do the things that he did. Okay, Richie overstepped the boundary. But this is what you get when you ask a guy that is crazy to do something for you. You get crazy and irrational results. So if you're the Dolphins, what did you think was going to happen when you asked and approached Richie Incognito and asked him to toughen up Jonathan Martin? I don't know what the hell they thought was going to happen. But I tell you this, you ask a crazy man to do something for you, don't be upset when he does something crazy. What did you think was going to happen? So, how did this happen? Why did it happen? Maybe Jonathan Martin's a little sensitive. Maybe. And that's debatable. Again, I don't know him personally. Don't know him as a man. So I don't want to go there. I'm not a judgmental person. That's not my character. It's not in my DNA. Who am I to judge anybody? However, the Dolphins probably have a lot of wrongdoing in this situation, Jonathan Martin probably has his own share of the wrongdoing. And uh, some of the Dolphin players, mainly Richie Incognito, probably are largely to blame for this whole situation. So how did this happen? The Dolphins had a lot to do with it. Richie Incognito had a lot to do with it. Those two probably had their hand in the cookie jar and got caught. Why did this happen? Jonathan Martin may be a little sensitive. Maybe he was pushed over the line. Maybe Richie Incognito crossed the line. If what we've heard is true, if that voicemail does exist, people have heard it, and that is accurate, he overstepped his boundaries, he crossed the line, and that's why this happened. So how did this happen? Why did this happen? Everybody had a hand in this occurring. Guys wanted better production, that being the Dolphins brass. A player in Richie Incognito was approached and asked to help them with that situation. He did it the best way he knew how to do it. Apparently, Jonathan Martin didn't show up for a couple of, um, you know, involuntary or voluntary, you know, mini camps in April. The NFL kills me with this. If you want guys to show up, say it's involuntary then. Make them come. Don't say it's voluntary and then get mad when you don't have 100% participation. If you have 96%, run with the 96% that you have and hope that the other 4% of guys that don't show up are working out on their own and doing what they're supposed to do. But if you want everybody to show up, make it involuntary and if they don't show up, you find them. But don't, don't say it's voluntary and then when they don't show up, you get mad. They got mad that he didn't show up and apparently Jonathan Martin had posted on Twitter that he was working out and so it kind of made people upset that, hey, we're here working out at the team facility. Why aren't you here with everybody else? If he wants to do his own thing, let him do his own thing. So how and why this happened, it's not a mystery, but it is to a certain extent. But there are so many different reasons how and why this happened. But at the end of the day, the Dolphins, Richie Incognito, some of the players on this team, the Dolphins, Brass, and Jonathan Martin are all guilty in this situation. So, 
Let's go to the culture in the locker room. And this is a big one for me. This is probably the most, to me, in-depth part of this discussion, at least from my vantage point, because there's a culture in a sports locker room and probably more so in a football locker room than any other sport there is. Keep in mind that when you play football, it is a diverse group of individuals that will be your teammates, that will be your coaches. From so many different backgrounds, you can't even keep track, all right? There's 53 players on any given NFL roster. That's 53 different individuals. You take yourself out of the equation, if you're in that locker room, there are 52 others in that locker room besides yourself. So put yourself in an NFL locker room. Maybe you play high school football. Go back to those days. Maybe you play college ball. Go back to those days. Think of how many other guys were in your locker room. All right? Think of how many different personalities there are. How many different upbringings there are. Everyone wasn't born with a silver spoon in their mouth. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Guys come from some really hardcore backgrounds. No dad. No mom. Mom and dad were drug addicts. You know, I raised my brother and sister. Grandma raised me. There are so many different stories of guys coming from impoverished neighborhoods and backgrounds that it's not funny. Just, just think of it as an, an NFL locker room has about hmm, 70% of its players that are black. And I don't want to exclude any other ethnicity from this discussion because there, there are white people that are poor. There are Samoan people that are poor. But look, for the basis of this argument, just listen to my, my commentary and listen to this explanation. There are about 70% of a locker room that's going to be black. And look, football is a predominantly black sport. You know, most of the athletes that you see on your TV screen are black in the National Football League. So in a locker room that has 53 players, let's assume, and again, this is an assumption that I'm making. This isn't a factual based assumption. This is just something that I'm throwing out there. This is a hypothetical situation. Let's assume the locker room is 70% black, which in most locker rooms, you'll probably find that that is a fact, but let's just go off of the hypothetical situation that a locker room has 53 players and 70% of it is black. Okay. Of the 70% that's black, 30 to 35% of those guys came from impoverished neighborhoods, okay? So you're dealing with a percentage of the locker room that they grew up a different way. Dog eat dog, it's me or it's you. And so you've got guys that grew up in a different situation. You know, they, all they know is something totally different than what you know, what you grew up with, okay? So you've got so many different personalities to juggle in a locker room. Growing up, I didn't play at a high level. I didn't play football at the college or, or the NFL level. I didn't play at the collegiate level. I played in high school. And I can say this. It was tough in the locker room. <laughs> because I grew up with a lot of guys that, that grew up in the hood, in the parks. We call them parks around here. We don't call them the ghetto. White people call it the ghetto. We don't call it the ghetto. People grew up in the park or they grew out the hood. They grew up in the hood. And these guys were grimy, you know, grimy cats that in the locker room, you could befriend them. But after you left the locker room, you didn't want to be with these guys because they were in some very nefarious and shady activity. And you knew that. And they were still your, they were still your boys in the locker room. They were still your teammates. But you knew once we leave this locker room, I can't hang with them because they're going to get into some things that I don't want to be a part of. And that's totally fine. But the culture in a locker room is one that's such that you have to adapt and adjust in a locker room. And what I mean by that is guys are going to be cruel. Guys are going to say some things. There are going to be some jokes that are said. Maybe you might be a little uncomfortable with some of them. You don't have to react. You don't have to get involved. But when 
the team does something as a team and, and they try to involve you, you need to conform, okay? As a team in the locker room, again, when you step outside the locker room, you don't have to concern yourself with your teammates if you don't want to. You go your way, they go theirs. But when you're in the locker room, it's a team. And you need to be a part of the team. And so if you start to distance yourself from the team, and I'm not saying that Jonathan Martin did or didn't. I don't know if he's a quiet guy. Again, I don't know all the facts. I'm just saying in a team faction, in a team environment, you got to be one of the guys. And you got to find a way to fit in. You know, you have to assimilate yourself into the team atmosphere. And again, you don't have to be involved in every single thing that they do. But again, you just want to be one of the guys. And if you start distancing yourself from the other guys on the team, they're going to start treating you as such in a locker room. And I'll give you an example. When you're drafted as a first round pick and you come into the league and this is where the hazing thing comes into play and we see it all the time. Some of it is meaningless, harmless, hazing. Some of it, guys cross the line. In a locker room, when you are a first round draft pick and you come in and you're highly touted and the team looks at you as a guy that can come in and immediately impact the football team. Some players are salty about that. Guys that have been on this roster five and six years haven't been compensated the way they think that they, maybe they should have been compensated. Here comes this rookie fresh out of college, wide-eyed, wet behind the ears, and he's already making more money than 85% of the guys in this locker room right now. How does that make the guys that have been scratching and clawing for a seven-year career feel? Makes them feel a little salty. So right there, you are already an outcast from the rest of the locker room. It's your job and the rest of the job of the guys in that locker room to make sure that you feel at home like you're in a family environment. Because sure, you make more money than them, but at the end of the day, that shouldn't matter. You shouldn't discuss anybody else's money. We're all a family. We all have one common goal, and that's winning. And so... Yeah, they might haze you a little bit. They might tie you to a goalpost and dump water on you. You know, they might make you carry helmets. They might make you go on a breakfast run. Yeah, those are things that rookies have to do to assimilate themselves into the locker room. But there are times when guys cross the line. We saw this in the New York Giants situation with Prince Amukamore. All right. And the idiot punter, Steve Weatherford, decided to video cam it, put it on Facebook and Twitter and all the different social media websites so that everyone could see bad taste and judgment by him. But it happened. Everyone got to see it. I watched it. And they tortured Prince of Mookamore. And, and they probably gave him a hard time in that Giants locker room because he was different. Prince of Mookamore is a guy that, much like A.C. Green, is celibate. And he's made a life decision, a life choice to not have sex until after he is married. I am, I am happy for him. I applaud him. That's a life decision that he chose. Not everyone else feels that way, but he does. Kudos to him for being able to make that decision and stick to it steadfast. So some of the Giants guys in the locker room <laughs> wanted to make light of that, wanted to make fun of him, and decided that this rookie comes in and he's supposed to be a guy that's going to come in and help us in the secondary. He's making all this money as a first-round pick. We're going to show him. So they decided to tie him up, pick him up, and dump him in cold water. Why? I don't know. Was it funny? No, it wasn't funny. How would you like that to be done to you? Ice cold water for no reason, just picked up and dumped it into. You're screaming, no, no, put me down, let me go. And they dump you in the water and they think it's funny. It happens. Your job as a football player, because you know these things go on in a locker room, is it right? No. But it happens. It's your job to suck it up and be one of the guys. Hey, y'all got me. Y'all got me. That was funny. Ha, ha, ha. You got me. Okay? You might be saying in your head, I hope you never, ever do that again. But on the outward appearance, you need to be able to say, hey, you guys got me. Suck it up and laugh it off. That's part of the locker room culture 
in the National Football League, in any locker room. Guys are going to pick with you. They're going to joke. They're going to joke. You're going to be the butt of jokes sometimes. It's your job to be able to laugh it off and be one of the guys. I don't think Jonathan Martin has that ability. And again, I don't know Jonathan Martin. And I don't know the severity of the jokes and the things that happened to him. But I know what Richie Incognito was reported to have done. And I tell you what, he crossed the line. And I don't know how long this went on for and all the things that Jonathan Martin had to endure. But I tell you what, you put yourself in his shoes. And let's go from that star to bullying, which I don't like the term bullying for adults. But let's just go to the next star, bullying. And you look at this situation and let's look at Jonathan Martin first. Let's give you a little bit of background on him. Both of his parents, Harvard educated parents. And he was born with a silver spoon in his mouth, essentially. He went to the best schools, he went to private schools. He probably never, ever had to deal with the type of things that go on in a public school setting. When guys are razzing you and giving you a hard time for no other reason than you just being you. And you got to be able to, to deal with it. You know, I played in a locker room where guys pick with you just because you were different. <laughs> you didn't live in their neighborhood. You didn't live in their house. You were different. I'm going to pick on you just because. You dealt with it. You know, and you were one of the guys. Jonathan Martin comes from a very privileged lifestyle. And that shouldn't exclude him from the rest of his teammates. That shouldn't make him any different. He's still a human being. He's still one of the guys. He's still your teammate. That shouldn't make him any different because he grew up somewhere else. But it did. And so he wasn't exposed to guys picking on him for no reason. He probably was one of the guys that was the big man on campus in his high school, in his private school that he went to. He was probably one of the guys that was respected in his locker room at Stanford. He probably was a captain. He didn't have to deal with bullying. You get to the NFL, and all of a sudden, guys start picking on you for no reason, and you don't understand why, and you've never had to deal with it in your life. See, other guys that have dealt with this type of stuff Growing up, it doesn't bother them. It doesn't phase them because I've been there. I've done that. I know how to deal with this. So it doesn't phase you. It doesn't make you go home and feel uncomfortable at night. You don't find yourself asking, why are they doing this to me? Because it's not a big deal to you. It rubs right off your back. It happens and you don't think twice about it. For a guy like Jonathan Martin who grew up in a sheltered environment where everything was fine and you didn't have to deal with this, it's tough. It's like him going back to being eight years old and having that guy pick on him every day at school, knowing that he can't go anywhere else, knowing that he has to go to school, he has to see that bully, he has to face him, he has to give him his lunch money. It's tough. But that's where I draw the line because you're 24 years old. You're a grown man. And no way am I going to let another man bully me punk me, make me give him money, let him make me feel uncomfortable, let him harass me. Now, did Jonathan Martin do the right thing? Sure he did. Because I've already stated to you that Jonathan Martin, he's not about that life. Versely, conversely, Richie Incognito is crazy. And even on the voicemail, he said, I'll kill you. Now, some of you might think he was joking and maybe he said that tongue-in-cheek, Richie Incognito is crazy. And if Jonathan Martin would have said, hey, you're not going to punk me, man. If you want to fight, let's fight. But this isn't going down. And he punched Richie Incognito in his face. Richie Incognito is crazy. He's the type of cat that you go to your car after practice and you drive home and Richie Incognito is waiting outside of your house to put two in your butt. And so he did the right thing. He went about it the proper way because he had to go about it the way that was going to make him the most safe. If he would have went about it trying to fight Richie Incognito, punching him in his face, this thing could have got ugly. Because again, he's crazy. He's Joey Porter crazy. Okay? Not, again, not ha-ha, funny-funny, I want you to get a 15-yard penalty crazy. He's, I want to do bodily harm to you outside of the football field crazy. He's the guy 
that steps on your fingers after the play is over. He's the guy that's choking you at the bottom of the pile. That's Richie Incognito. He's crazy, crazy, okay? So Jonathan Martin, he's not crazy, crazy, okay? So he didn't need to go about it that way. Some guys can handle themselves, others cannot. And so he went about it the right way, but the term bullying, I don't like to use that term because again, you're a grown man. There's no such thing to me as being bullied as a grown man. Again, I, I limit it to certain situations. Maybe you're in the military and you're being bullied by your constituents. Maybe there's five or six guys that are ganging up on you and your superiors aren't doing anything about it and there's not much you can do about it. Yeah, maybe you're being bullied. But in a setting like this, you're a grown man, you're on a football team. No, no, you're not being bullied. There's things you can do. There's steps you can take to ensure that this doesn't continue. Now, I don't know what those exact steps are. You know, everybody handles things differently, but there are ways to make sure that this doesn't continue. So, nah, not really buying the bullying thing, but he was treated very harshly. That's for sure. So that brings me to the next and final star. Reaction to this whole ordeal. My initial reaction to this was, man, Jonathan Martin seems a little soft. But I knew that that wasn't the right, and look, you're, the first reaction for many people is normally the right one. For me, I know my initial reaction normally isn't the right one because I take a knee-jerk reaction to everything, every single thing that happens. And that's why I normally don't talk about things when it first happens because the first thing that I spit out of my mouth when something happens is normally the first thing that comes off the top of my head. And generally, it's not the right thing. I have to take an objective approach to things. I have to be able to take a step back and look at a situation for what it's really worth. And sometimes when you just initially react to something, <laughs> I say something like I said when I, initially, when I initially saw this, which was, man, Jonathan Martin is being soft. You can't go about it that way. That's how my dad reacts to this. And my dad is one of those guys, he's not a big fan of people being gay and he's not a fan of people being soft. You know, man up, he's from a different era. He's from a time where, you know, you didn't cry. You got tough, you know. If somebody pushed you down, you got back up, you dusted yourself off, and you fought him, you know. He's from an era where you didn't get in a fight and get beat up and, and just went home because your parents would have told you, hey, go back out there and fight until you win. So he's from a different era. You know, nowadays guys aren't tough. They're not mentally tough. You get in a fight, you go and you shoot somebody. You don't, you don't go out and handle it like men you go and you get a gun and you shoot somebody. It's a different time now. And so I had to take a step back and say to myself, no, that's not how this situation needs to be looked at and assessed. I don't know all the details. I need to hear more before I make a judgment on Jonathan Martin. And again, I'm not a judgmental guy. And, and I don't need to make a judgment on him. I need to make a judgment about this situation. And so... I was attacking this situation all wrong because I was attacking the person initially. And that's not what is supposed to be happening in this situation. You're supposed to be attacking this ordeal and what happened and, and how it transpired, not the actual individual itself. Or so I looked at this situation and I said, okay, what happened? And I found out some of the details and I found out some of the backstory and I said, no, this isn't right. You know, Jonathan Martin was wronged here. Now, did he go about it right? Maybe, maybe not. I mean, Ricky Williams had his two cents being an ex-Dolphin, dealing with a situation where he left his team and left the NFL at one point prematurely. And he basically said, I don't know if Jonathan Martin belongs in the National Football League. Maybe he's not tough enough. And I don't know if that's the stance that I necessarily have. Okay. Ricky Williams had some good points, and, and he talked about, you know, the culture of the league and, and how they are taught to bully, you know, people on the field. And so hard to turn that switch off sometimes when you're not on the field. But, you know, it's different for every locker room. Like, I heard Dante Whitner come out and talk about the 49ers locker room and how they're like a family and they don't have this type of issue. And it starts at the top. Jim Harbaugh. He laid down the law in that locker room and said, hey, we're not doing the whole hazing thing. We're not doing that 
in this locker room. It doesn't serve a purpose. We're a family. We don't need to do that to come together as a group. And I can respect that, you know. I, I would wish that more, you know, NFL locker rooms would adopt that principle. But because I can tell you, in baseball, I was a team captain. And my first year on the baseball team, they wanted to haze me, you know. And, and their hazing ritual entailed, you know, you being thrown in the mud. You won't throw me. I'm not getting in the damn mud. What's wrong with you? What do I look like to you? You know? And a lot of the other younger guys, they went along with it. I was like, no, I'm not getting in the mud. Get off of me. You know, that was my whole stance. And so you could call me what you want. You know, a guy that didn't want to go with tradition and, and didn't want to follow the rules. But I wasn't, you weren't throwing me in the mud. I mean, I was a young guy and mentally I was wired differently. I'm not getting in the mud. You're not throwing me in the mud. Get off me. You know, if you want, if you want to fight, we can fight. If you think I'm getting in the mud, but you're not throwing me in the mud. So that's how I chose to address that situation. And, you know, you have some guys that feel the same way. I'm not doing it. You're not going to punk me. Okay. So that's how things get touchy and guys get bent out of shape. And then all of a sudden you don't have a good relationship with your teammates because you didn't want to do what they wanted you to do. And they have ways of forcing you to do things. I mean, that's the call that goes back to the culture in the locker room. You don't want to do this? Fine. We'll get you for that. We, you know, we'll fix you. You know, we'll make you conform. We will break you as a player if you don't want to conform. And that's why I said you have to be able to adjust and adapt in a locker room. And so the reaction to this ordeal, I want to look at it from a, a couple of different perspectives and then we'll get out of here. Number one, I looked at the reaction around the league from players and some of the players on the Dolphins team have come out in support of Richie Incognito and I was reading an article on Pro Football Talk talking about how they needed to keep quiet in Miami. They need to stop talking in Miami. You know, Ryan Tannehill, Mike Wallace, a lot of these guys have come out in support of Richie Incognito and they don't know the whole situation, but it sounds to me like some of these guys don't even care. You know, they, they know Richie Incognito as a player, as a man in that locker room. They've seen him interact with Jonathan Martin, and they feel like Jonathan Martin is to blame for this situation. And that's what you don't want to start doing. You don't want to start pointing the blame because you don't want this to be a situation where Jonathan Martin doesn't feel welcome to return to the Miami Dolphins football team. But that's essentially how this situation is being painted, as if he can't come back. And you never want to feel like you can't come back home. But that's essentially how this situation is playing out. They're making Jonathan Martin out to be a snitch. And that's not fair to Jonathan Martin because he was put in a situation where he was the outcast. He was the outsider. He was treated differently for no reason. He didn't want to go to a trip to Vegas that Richie Incognito and the other office linemen had planned and they all wanted $10,000, $15,000 as a contribution to make this thing go. And Jonathan Martin said, I, I don't want to go. That's his choice. I don't want to go. Richie Incognito said, no, you're going to go. He said, no, I don't want to go. He said, well, okay, fine. You don't want to go. You're still going to pay your portion of the trip. Give me the money. Jonathan Martin, he gave in. He paid the money. He was essentially punked out of ten or fifteen thousand dollars he's not built to stand up to that type of pressure you know when somebody puts that kind of pressure on him he, he essentially reverted back to being an eight-year-old kid and being bullied and he allowed a guy like richie incognito to exert his will over him and, and say hey you're going to do this or else and so we don't know what Jonathan Martin went through. Again, you don't know the whole story, but I will say this. I hope that the National Football League does not, and we know Roger is famous for this. Commissioner Roger Goodell is famous for overreacting to things and kind of casting a blanket solution over problems. Because this happened here, we won't allow it to happen throughout the rest of the league so this is the punishment for this. I hope he doesn't do that in this situation because even though this was a separate entity and this was an ordeal that happened 
and I don't think that this happens in every single locker room in the National Football League. Maybe it happens in a couple more, but I don't think it's taken to the extent that it was taken in this situation. Guys are hazed all the time. You know how it goes. We see it on hard knocks firsthand. Guys are hazed. You know, there are some things that you have to do as a player or else <laughs> it's going to be tough for you. But in this particular case, Richie Incognito stepped over the line. And I hope Roger Goodell addresses this individual case, you know, and punishes the Dolphins, you know, if they had anything to do with it, Richie Incognito for his involvement, and whoever else has something to do with it. Punish those players. Don't punish everybody else in the league for this. Okay, don't make this a situation where you start looking for things and start probing for things and try to bring everybody involved in this because that's not what this is. So I hope the reaction to this is not an overreaction because this was a separate case. And I'm pretty sure guys around the league deal with things all the time. But like I said, you got to be able to adjust and adapt in a National Football League and locker room. And I'm not saying that it's okay or, or that it's right or that things like this should occur but it, it does and you've got to be able to adapt to it and, and brush it off so this whole Jonathan Martin situation is so convoluted it's such a complex situation but this Dolphins team they're going to be affected by this that's all anybody's going to want to talk they're on Monday Night Football this is the worst week for them to be on Monday Night Football I'm pretty sure they wish they didn't have any more nationally televised games because that's all that they're going to talk about is this Jonathan Martin situation. And it's not going away anytime soon. And I don't even know if he can come back to the team. And that's the, the bad part about this. That's what's a shame in all of this is that I don't know if he can come back to the team and feel like just one of the guys anymore. Because uh, some people might look at him as a snitch and look at him as an outsider and an outcast now. And yeah, I think Jonathan Martin's a, a little sensitive. I mean, that prank that sent him over the top, I mean, really, that's not something that you get bent out of shape about. But, you know, again, I don't know how long this has been going on for, and that just sent him over the top. That put him at his threshold. That was his tolerance, and it had been exceeded after that, that stunt where everybody tells him, hey, come sit down at the table with, you know, everybody else. And as he sits down, everybody else gets up. I mean, that's a harmless prank. Not one that you should get bent out of shape over. But again, when you've had the things done to him that he's had done to him, that just sent him over the top. That meant a lot more than what it was. That signified something else for him. And so this is a nightmare for the Dolphins. One that's not going to go away. One that they're probably not going to be able to wake up from. But... Hopefully, this situation is resolved. I hope Jonathan Martin gets the help that he needs. I also hope that he's able to come back and play football because it's not fair to him if he's not able to come back and play football. And I hope that the Dolphins locker room embraces him as one of their own, as one of their brothers, and they don't look at him as a snitch and a guy that can't handle a little bit of razzing, a little bit of rusing. And um, I think Richie Incognito's career in the National Football League is effectively over as of this suspension. The Dolphins have said that they're going to cut ties with him. They can't cut him this year because of a monetary situation. If they cut him, they'll owe him about $3 million. They hold on to him. They won't have to pay him nearly as much. So he'll be cut at the end of the season. So uh, I, don't, I don't know. If I see another team picking Richie, Richie Incognito up. I just don't. So... And I don't know, uh, Roger Goodell might suspend this guy indefinitely and not reinstate him for a while. So, I mean, who knows? I mean, the NFL is a funny sport. I mean, if this guy sits down for a year and a half and a team still feels like he can help, he might be signed to the St. Louis Rams in a year and a half from now. So, who knows? But this is a crazy subject matter. Felt like I needed to talk about it. That's some food for thought. I'm done. You go ahead and clean up the dishes and wipe the table off when you're done. Like the content? Want more? Sub up.
in the lab room.